Okay, everybody, welcome back. Uh, this is Mr. Miller here again, and this is uh, Thursday, the 30th of April, the final day of April. It's crazy. April's already gone. Um, we didn't even see each other in April at all, which is a little crazy. So anyways, we're going to go ahead and move on today. Uh, the past couple days, we've been looking at uh, topic 16 through 18 homework. Uh, we've been looking at uh, that uh, worksheet where it was the timeline to fill out African American history leading up to 1950. We're going to jump right in today to topic 16 through 18 notes. And the first five points on our notes are all dealing with the African American uh, civil rights era, I guess you might call it. So we'll be looking at that a little bit more closely today and at the very beginning of class tomorrow. So added to this, uh, added to this document or this assignment is the notes page. So hopefully you've got that open or printed off or whatever you would do with it usually. Um, hopefully that's there and you can find that okay. It's in a PDF and a Word document. So you've got that okay. Uh, so I will start ahead here with uh, topics 16 through 18 notes. And this PowerPoint is also posted there in case you needed to go back through and look at it. So uh, we'll get right into it here. Uh, our first point here, uh, number one, it says uh, Brown v. Board of Education and desegregation efforts. Okay, and we're all looking at the civil rights movement here. Now, uh, Brown v. Board of Education, it is a Supreme Court case. Usually Supreme Court cases we have in italics, uh, and it's usually somebody versus somebody. So this Brown v. Board of Education is uh, also a Supreme Court case. This happens to be one of the major Supreme Court cases that we are going to talk about throughout the entire year. Uh, we have already uh, talked about a number of them, but this one would be one of the top, one of the top three or four. Uh, this one, if we were uh, still in school, would definitely go on my poster of uh, the Mount Rushmore of Supreme Court cases. This would be the last one to go on there. So Brown v. Board of Education, it is a Supreme Court case that challenges segregation. Segregation, as you know, uh, the division between uh, the division between races and the kind of forced division, uh, forced discrimination, forced segregation. You've got this this um, division and the uh, any any real aspect of American society. There are dividers placed different drinking fountains, different bathrooms, different uh, rules about restaurants and service at schools, uh, all sorts of things. So segregation was widespread at this point. Uh, it was put in place by another Supreme Court case uh, called Plessy versus Ferguson. Uh, Plessy versus Ferguson, uh, if you remember, uh, implemented in the late 1890s, implemented a, a phrase called separate but equal meaning as long as these facilities are equal, they can be separate. So the uh, Brown v. Board of Education, uh, there was a, a group of parents who were in Kansas, in Topeka, Kansas. Topeka is just a city in Kansas. Um, Topeka, I, is that the capital of Kansas? I think it is. Uh, Topeka. Yeah, I think it is. I'm blanking on my capital here for a second, but I think it's the capital of Kansas. So there's a group of par a group of parents. There are African American parents uh, with kids in the school system, and they had the argument that uh, their education that their kids were getting was not the same education as white kids were getting. Okay, so I will show you a couple pictures here. Uh, so first here, and these were taken in Topeka, Kansas, uh, right at uh, 1950. Uh, so this uh, Board of Education, Brown v. Board of Ed, happened in 1954. So this is more or less the, the quality of education that they're talking about. So we'll look at these two pictures. This first picture is a white classroom uh, at, a, at a white school. It's pretty crowded, obviously. Um, not social distancing. This would hopefully not be what we would be looking at when we would go back to school eventually. Um, but you've got pictures on the wall. You've got nice new desks. Everybody's reading a book. Uh, you've got a, uh, n uh, I don't know, cursive letters running across the top of the blackboard. Everything's nice and clean. So there you go. That's, that's one. Uh, those desks, by the way, look like they're straight out of, uh, straight out of like a space shuttle. 
uh, I just see those those rounded desks and they make me think of like space age, which makes sense that this is the 1950s. Uh, so now let's look at an African-American school in Topeka, Kansas, in the same exact city. So here is the uh, here is the room. Uh, you have some kids with with books on their desks. You have others who do not have them. Uh, you have old hand-me-down desks. Uh, these desks would have been uh, very interesting. You would have had uh, your seat uh, would have had like a fold-down uh, front to it, and then attached to the back of your seat would have been the writing part for the other person. So if you're sitting in front of somebody who's like erasing really heavily or frantically, you're probably like shaking all over the place because they're erasing on your seat, essentially. Uh, so that's kind of weird, and it is not not new by any means. These are very old desks. Uh, at this point, they would be antiques, like nowadays. Um, but uh, it's just not just not the same. Uh, I think that you can you can appreciate the fact that these two these two things are not the same. Uh, the lighting in these rooms, even just think about reading a book and trying to actually see the see the words on the page. Uh, this you're just dealing with light coming in from the window. It looks like so uh, there's there's differences here. Now the people here who were attending these schools are the parents that Brown and uh, Brown is the name of one of the parents. Uh, he's the first the first guy alphabetically, so he gets his name on the case. It's actually Brown et al, meaning Brown and everybody else versus the Board of Education of Topeka. So all these parents they're saying you know because our kids are going to separate schools, they are unequal uh, just because they're different. They're unequal. So this goes to the Supreme Court. Supreme Court ultimately rules that, yes, in fact, uh, this segregation uh, was unequal, meaning that just the simple fact that these two groups are segregated from each other makes them unequal. You cannot give equal treatment or equal uh, education just by uh, saying that you're going to do it. You can't give equal treatment unless you actually have everybody in the same room. So basically the court says segregation causes inequalities and uh, they outlaw that provision that is called separate but equal. So that uh, provision from Plessy versus Ferguson gets totally thrown out of this whole thing. Uh, so it's outlawed at this point. So now we get to the time period where uh, the Brown versus Board of Education uh, ruling, which really was pertaining to schools, but also gets a, tried to apply to other areas of American society. So we'll start looking into this a little bit. Uh, this is a kind of a interesting picture. I find it kind of a cool picture. But uh, this girl there, uh, pictured there carrying a little briefcase, her name is Linda Brown. She is the daughter of the guy who led that Supreme Court case. So she is partly one of the reasons why this court case got brought out, which is which is a really inspiring thing. Uh, but here she is after the court case was decided, uh, she got to go to a, an inclusive school or a desegregated school. And because she was such a high profile name, because everybody kind of knew her, uh, what they did was they had uh, the United States Marshals uh, had to escort her in and out of school and kind of stay with her uh, because she was under, I, I guess, under the opportunity to be attacked by other people, which is crazy, but it is uh, an unfortunate reality. And we're going to look at uh, a little bit more today some of these un unfortunate realities of the 1950s as people are trying to integrate, get back to, uh, get back to an, or get to an integrated society. Now, uh, this next group here that I got to mention uh, also goes under desegregation efforts. Uh, they are referred to as the Little Rock Nine, the Little Rock Nine. Um, Little Rock is the capital of Arkansas. Uh, so Little Rock down in the south. Uh, Little Rock High School was supposed to be desegregated and uh, it was ordered to be desegregated under uh, under this ruling. And they opened it up originally with nine uh, African-American students. So the Central High School in Little Rock, they were going to start the school year. Uh, and this was in 19, I think 1957. I don't have it written down, but uh, a few years after the uh, Brown v. Board of Education ruling. 
Uh, so they were going to open it up with nine African Americans and they were going to go to school and start desegregating this school uh, little by little. So here you have a picture in the top corner of these Little Rock Nine, as they are called, uh, these students who were chosen to uh, go into the school. And uh, this picture down on the, the bottom right is what they were met with uh, the first day. Uh, the Arkansas, uh, there was like uh, the, I think it was the Arkansas State Police or something like that, uh, had lined up outside of the school to prevent the African American students from coming into the school. So these are the state, the state police officers for the, the state who is, who is supposed to be integrating. Uh, the law enforcement body is, is refusing to allow uh, these African American students into the high school. And then you are met with um, tons of people outside who are protesting. Okay, so this is one of uh, this uh, lady in the front here in the white dress. Uh, she's one of the Little Rock Nine, and she's being screamed at by people as she's trying to walk into school, which is which is just what she is trying to do, and that's what she's supposed to be allowed to do. But uh, she's uh, very very much um, kind of looked down upon for this. Now. Uh, the President of the United States, Dwight D. Eisenhower, ends up needing to send in uh, the National Guard to uh, enforce this desegregation effort. So eventually it works, but it takes a little bit of time uh, and takes a little bit of effort to get there, I guess. So uh, crazy stuff is crazy stuff is kind of happening here. Okay, let me go ahead and move on to number two. Um, Number two, Montgomery Bus Boycott. To start with, uh, the Montgomery Bus Boycott is probably one of the more famous uh, civil rights era protests that happen. Uh, they all center around, uh, of course, a uh, lady by the name of Rosa Parks. So Rosa Parks was an African-American lady. She was traveling to work, and the Montgomery bus system in Montgomery, Alabama, had a rule that if you were an African-American, you had to sit in the back of the bus if a white person wanted your seat in the front of the bus. So uh, Rosa Parks sits down on the bus, refuses to move uh, on her, I think she was coming back from work, uh, refuses to move, gets arrested, and uh, kind of enters into our cultural understanding uh, from there on out, because now we know who Rosa Parks is and we, we know what she's all about. Uh, famous guy gets his start here, kind of leading this Montgomery bus boycott. His name would be Martin Luther King Jr., uh, whose name is uh, listed in number three, and we'll talk about him more. So Martin Luther King Jr., uh, he leads this uh, bus boycott. Basically, every or almost every African American in the city of Montgomery refused to use the bus system, and they were some of the the heavy users of the bus system. Uh, so this bus uh, boycott ends up lasting for about a year, uh, and ends up with the Montgomery bus system uh, kind of opening up and ending their desegregate or ending their segregated policies. So the pol so the um, the protest is successful, so that's pretty good. Uh, next up here, the Greensboro sit-in. Let me go on to the next uh, slide here. The Greensboro sit-in. So these four guys up here in the top left picture, uh, they are college students in Greensboro, North Carolina, and they go into a place that's uh, kind of a restaurant. It's called a lunch counter, uh, but department stores would have these lunch counters in them. Imagine going to, like, Macy's or J.C. Penney's and going there for lunch, okay, while you're shopping. Uh, that's kind of what they've got going on. Think of, I mean, we don't really have any Ikeas around here, but Ikea, they have lunch places. Uh, so if you've ever been to Ikea, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, but we have uh, this lunch counter where you can go and, and sit and get a get a bite to eat while you're shopping. So these guys go there and sit down and they're like, hey, we want some lunch. And uh, the owner of the lunch counter says, nope, we refuse to serve African Americans at this lunch counter. So they say, okay, well, we'll just sit here until you start serving us. So they sit there all day. Uh, the store closes. They come back the next day and they come back the next day and they come back the next day. They bring more and more people with them. Uh, almost all, or I mean, a lot of African Americans, but also some white, white people who are like, no, we don't want to be served until they're served. Uh, so it was a, a sit-in protest. They, that's why they call it the Greensboro sit-in. So these guys here, they're called the Greensboro Four. Uh, 
uh, they end up leading a sit-in here, and these protests end up popping up across the country. Uh, similar protests that are all sit-ins uh, and all just kind of doing the same sort of thing. So again, a different way to kind of get notoriety or um, I guess support in that way. So the Greensboro sit-in ultimately is effective as well. Now, uh, the last thing on this slide would be uh, the Freedom Ride. Okay, so the other two pictures here are pictures of the Freedom Ride. Basically, there was a group of uh, African Americans and uh, white people who uh, decided they were going to challenge segregation laws in the South. So they get on a bus in Washington, D.C., and they travel down. Uh, their goal is to travel down, I believe, to Birmingham or Montgomery, Alabama, somewhere in Alabama, uh, I believe is where they were supposed to end up. Uh, but they go in pairs, so one African American, one uh, white American, uh, and they're kind of working together. Uh, and, and kind of testing these segregation laws. Uh, this thing goes absolutely crazy because uh, they're riding on these Greyhound buses, these public buses that you can get tickets for. Uh, but when they get into cities, they've got mobs waiting for them and they've got uh, people who stop them on the highway and burn down their buses, which is pictured here in these two pictures. Uh, so these, uh, the people in the South went absolutely nuts over this, this freedom ride because they didn't like what it stood for. So um, ultimately, uh, the president, and this happens in uh, the early 60s, the president, John F. Kennedy, ends up, uh, ends up going in and basically forcing, uh, forcing the government to uh, protect these riders before they get injured more than they already were. Uh, which is which is crazy, but that is that's what they had to do. So uh, it's just a crazy, crazy time period that we're dealing with here. Uh, lots of resistance to uh, lots of resistance to this desegregation. Now uh, let's go on to number three: Martin Luther King Jr. and the March on Washington. So Martin Luther King Jr. is a well-known individual. He's a minister. He's a preacher from Alabama, uh, and he ends up leading the civil rights movement. Uh, he is kind of the the main figure here that we've we've got to talk about through this whole thing. Uh, and Martin Luther King Jr. He uses uh, ideas uh, kind of thought up, uh, and we've mentioned them before. Uh, ideas of civil disobedience, uh, which I've got over here. We'd mentioned them from Henry David Thoreau. Uh, you guys know of them from last year as uh, practices by uh, Mohandas Gandhi. Uh, so civil disobedience is. Uh, this idea that you're going to refuse to follow the law if you don't agree with it. So you refuse to follow the law. Uh, Martin Luther King Jr. ends up getting imprisoned multiple times. Uh, he gets imprisoned in Birmingham, Alabama once, and that leads him to uh, write a document. And I've got that right here uh, called Letter from a Birmingham Jail. Letter from a Birmingham Jail. Uh, sorry, it's a little small. I was trying to squeeze it in there. Uh, but it didn't work, and it just turned out horrible, so I apologize. Uh, letter from a Birmingham jail, and in this letter, he kind of outlines uh, outlines what he wants to do with the civil rights movement, what changes he wants to see made uh, with the civil rights movement. So uh, Martin Luther King Jr. here uh, leads also uh, something that we call the March on Washington. Okay, Washington, D.C., the capital. Uh, Martin Luther King Jr. leads the March on Washington. This happens to be the biggest civil rights movement, or the biggest civil rights, uh, I guess I guess it's a protest, uh, but um, gathering, I guess you might call it. Uh, the biggest civil rights gathering ever in American history uh, is this March on Washington, to my knowledge, ever. Um, certainly the biggest one we're going to talk about. So here's Martin Luther King Jr. at the March on Washington. Uh, the March on Washington was uh, kind of culminating at the or ending at the uh je, or the uh Lincoln Memorial uh the Lincoln Memorial which uh, symbolically Lincoln was viewed as kind of the guy who fought to get slaves their freedom uh so here you've got uh, a picture here in the in the bottom left uh Martin Luther King Jr in the center here uh, and he is walking alongside arm in arm hand in hand with civil rights leaders of the day uh, as they lead this pack to Washington. And then here on the right is uh, a picture of the Washington Monument in the background. 
Uh, the Capitol building is way behind that, but uh, facing kind of in the front of this picture at the very bottom is where the speaking would have happened from. Uh, if you uh, have ever seen the movie Forrest Gump, um, Forrest Gump, uh, there is a Vietnam War protest that happens at this site uh, at the uh, at the reflection pool or the reflecting pool and the, the Lincoln Memorial. Uh, and that's where, uh, that's where Forrest jumps into the reflecting pool and goes and gets, uh, goes and meets with Jenny, uh, finds Jenny. Uh, so that's, uh, what ends up happening here in, uh, that's later on though. That's Forrest Gump. So, uh, this is a big moment though. Okay. This, this March in Washington, there are 200,000, protesters that show up at this March on Washington. And uh, Martin Luther King Jr. delivers uh, one of the most famous uh, speeches in American history. Uh, we call it the I have a dream speech. Uh, I have a dream. Uh, you have undoubtedly heard bits and pieces of the I have a dream speech. Uh, it is a very famous speech. It's 16 something ish minutes long. Uh, you can listen to it if you want to. It's on YouTube in a number of places. Uh, so you can go ahead and listen to that if you wanted to. But it's just talking about how he has this dream that African-Americans will one day be equal uh, with uh, white Americans. So that's kind of the the moral of the story there. Now, uh, let's go ahead and uh, move on to number four, and then we'll be done. So civil rights legislation, uh, civil rights laws that are passed. Uh, there are three main laws that we've got to talk about here. Uh, the first one uh, is called uh, the Civil Rights Act, the Civil Rights Act there in red. Uh, the Civil Rights Act was passed in 1964. And what it does, it bans segregation in public places. So any public areas cannot have segregation in it. Uh, so that's a noteworthy thing. Now, private places still are kind of a gray area, but at this point, it is public places, no segregation at all. So I believe this picture here is uh, Lyndon B. Johnson, the president after John F. Kennedy, and we'll talk about both of these guys further tomorrow. Uh, but uh, Johnson here signing the Civil Rights Act uh, in the presence of, right behind him, look at that, Martin Luther King Jr. looking over his shoulder. Uh, so that's a, kind of a nice thing. Now, uh, there were also two other, uh, two other things to mention here. Uh, there is a constitutional amendment that gets passed. Uh, it is the 24th Amendment. Uh, the 24th Amendment bans the use of poll taxes. Okay, if you remember, poll taxes were, uh, poll taxes were used to charge somebody a little bit of money to have to vote. Uh, so that is ruled unconstitutional, or not ruled unconstitutional, but it's removed from the Constitution. So there is no opportunity for poll taxes under the 24th Amendment, 2-4. Um, and then the final one here is uh, down here in blue, the Voting Rights Act. Uh, the Voting Rights Act was passed in 1965, a year after the Civil Rights Act. Uh, and the Voting Rights Act did away with uh, literacy tests, literacy tests, uh, having to prove that you know how to read in order to vote. So uh, this ends up improving uh, the ability for African Americans to be able to vote. All of these things kind of working together. The Voting Rights Act, the 24th Amendment, uh, get a lot of African Americans involved in uh, voting. And the Civil Rights Act kind of has the, the role of getting the government involved in enforcing desegregation. So if you have desegregation that the government knows about, the government has to step in and stop it or has to step in and try to stop it. So that is uh, kind of a, you know, it's a good thing moving forward. It's a good thing. So uh, that is kind of where we're going to leave off. After number four, we will get into number five tomorrow, which is Malcolm X and the Black Panthers. So uh, with all that being said, I have two essential questions that I have posted uh, in a separate assignment. So go ahead on Google Classroom and move over to that. Uh, so answer those two essential questions and then you'll be done. Also reminder, get some work in uh, turned into me uh, so that I can get it updated into the grade book. Uh, if you can get any of that work from the previous time, uh, the previous few weeks uh, in, 
Uh, hopefully by Sunday, I'm going to start updating things on Monday and Tuesday and then get them uploaded completely. But I'll kind of deal with things as they trickle in. Um, but even if you miss that deadline, you might end up with an incomplete. Even if you make that deadline, you still might end up with an incomplete. And then you'll have to do some extra work uh, after the marking period ends. Uh, so then you can get up to a passing grade. So uh, that's all I got. If you've got questions for me, let me know. Uh, if you got questions for me, let me know. That's all i got to say about that. So we'll see you again tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow is Friday, so it will be a catch-up day, but I'll remind you guys of that tomorrow. So uh, with that, I am going to sign off. Take care.